This problem represents an application of Hesse's law. The idea that if we start from the same initial state and we end at the same final state, then how many steps or the steps we take to get from where we start to where we finish does not change the state function that in this case would be the enthalpy change for the overall reaction. Think of it this way. You could have a set of stairs, whether it's five stairs, 20 stairs, 100 stairs, doesn't matter. Your goal is to get from the bottom to the top. There is a height change that you want to accomplish. Maybe it's 100 feet. You want to go 100 feet up because the top of the stairs is 100 feet away from where you are. Well, if I had my way of doing it, I just walk up the stairs one foot at a time. One, two, three, four, five, six, all the way to 100. I've taken 100 steps that have led me from the bottom of the stairs to the top of the stairs. My change in height is 100 feet. Now, if I had a situation like my son, who sometimes likes to run up stairs two and three steps at a time, then maybe he's going two, four, six, eight, ten feet at a time, taking less steps than I am. But at the end of the day, he's still gone up 100 feet because we're both standing at the top of the same stairs after starting at the bottom of the same stairs. And if I know a third person who had a jet pack, who don't, doesn't take any steps, they just turn on their jet pack and go in one complete step, well, they would have also gone up 100 feet as well because they're standing beside me and my son after starting at the bottom. So the jet pack is kind of like the overall reaction we're interested in. We're trying to figure out what's happening in one step. In this case, it's the combustion reaction for methane to give us carbon dioxide and water. Now we have to be very careful in these applications because we've seen enthalpy changes depend on conditions. They depend on state. And one of the factors in states is the phase of matter. So you'll notice that that water, we have to be very specific, is liquid water in this particular case. If we solve this problem for gaseous water, we are going to get a different answer. Ultimately, because technically we're talking about a different energy content at the end. So always pay attention to your states of matter in this particular case. Now in this case, we're going to try and figure out what the enthalpy change is in kilojoules per mole for this reaction, jetpack, in one step by looking at three separate steps we could work together to try and make a situation where we start at the same point, methane and two oxygen as reactants, and end at the same point, carbon dioxide and two water, liquid, as products. Now to do that, we actually have to do some bookkeeping. There's many different processes, many different ways to approach Hess's law problems. There is no one right way of doing this. You need to find the way that works for you. The one I show you is really about bookkeeping. So what we're going to do is make a list. And in this list, we are going to look at really our reactants for the thing we're interested in and our products. And there's two things that need to go in the list. For each reactant, we need its chemical identity with phase and the stoichiometric coefficient. So that's one methane gas and two oxygen gas. Those represent our starting state, the bottom of the stairs. And that starting state has a certain amount of energy within it. Our products, one CO2 gas and two water liquid or our final state, that's the top of the stairs. Or maybe it's the bottom, again, endothermic, exothermic. The whole point is it's where we've ended up. Now, that carbon dioxide and water probably contains a different amount of energy than the methane and the oxygen did. I can pretty much guarantee it because it's a combustion reaction. It probably contains a whole lot less energy and energy has likely been released. We're going to expect a negative number because it's a combustion reaction. So, what does that mean? Well, now we have to look at our three-step reactions and essentially start making a list of where our reactants and products show up because what we're really trying to do is find those reactants and products that show up in one and only one 
of the step reactions we have, because that's really going to help us in the long term. So let's look at methane. Well, we see that methane shows up in step reaction one as a reactant with a stoichiometric coefficient of one. That's useful for us. If we look through our other step reactions, we don't see methane show up anywhere else. That's good. That means there's only one place we can get our methane from in all our steps we're trying to work together. It's from step reaction one. Let's look at oxygen. Now oxygen we see shows up in step reaction one and step reaction two. Since it shows up in two places, that's not really useful for us right now. So let's just ignore it for now, but let's just kind of keep track of where it is, but maybe do it in a different color. So we can say to ourselves, wait a second, that's showing up in two different places. That's step reaction one with a stoichiometric coefficient of one as a reactant. And it's also showing up in step reaction two with a stoichiometric coefficient of one as a reactant. Again, this is useful bookkeeping situations. Now let's do the same thing for our products. Carbon dioxide does not show up in our first step reaction, but it does show up in our second and not our third. In our situation, it's showing up in our second step reaction with a stoichiometric coefficient of one as a product. That's good for us. And then we've got two liquid water. Well, step reactions one and two do contain water, but it's gaseous water. That is not fundamentally the chemical we're looking for. So those do not count in our list. We don't want to put liquid water, uh, gaseous water in there because we need our product to be liquid. It's only the third one, the third step reaction, where we see liquid water with a stoichiometric coefficient of one as a reactant. So what we're effectively trying to do is match up the two pieces of information for each chemical that only shows up in one place. We need to match the stoichiometric coefficients and we need to match whether it's a reactant or product. There's two and only two things we can do to make that work. If the stoichiometric coefficient doesn't match what we want from the overall balanced equation we're trying to figure out, we can multiply our step reaction by some factor until the stoichiometric coefficient matches. So what I'm going to use for the example here is water. We've got a stoichiometric coefficient of two here. We've got a stoichiometric coefficient of one here. Effectively, that means that our third step reaction has what we want, but it doesn't have enough. It has one stoichiometric coefficient worth when we need two. That tells us that we need to take step reaction three and multiply by two. In doing that, I'm going to take that one and make it a two. But that means the delta H for step reaction three also needs to be multiplied by two because enthalpy is an extensive property. It depends on the amount. I put a certain amount of water in the kettle, turn it on. It's going to take, let's say, two minutes to boil. If I double the amount of water in the kettle and turn it on, it's going to take twice as long because I'm going to need to put in twice as much energy because there's twice as much stuff to raise the temperature of. That goes back to Q equals MCS delta T. We're increasing the mass or the amount of stuff, and therefore, that's what we've got. The other thing that we can do or have to do or can do is that if we want something as a product, but our step reaction has it as a reactant, we can always flip the reaction. Reversing a process makes the energy change of equal amount, but opposite sign. That's no different than if we take an ice cube and melt it, we're gonna put a certain amount of energy in. If I take that exact same amount of energy out from the liquid water that came from the melting of the ice cube, it's gonna freeze again. And so what we see here is that we want our two waters to be products, 
But in the step reaction we have, that liquid water is a reactant. So we are going to need to reverse step reaction three as well, which means delta H for three is also gonna to have to be multiplied by minus one. We're effectively changing the sign. Overall, what that means is, ooh, let's try a nice new color. Step reaction three is being reversed and multiplied by two. So delta H for this is going to be minus two times the delta H of step reaction three. What is the new step reaction three that has that enthalpy change? It's gonna be two water gas becoming two water liquid. This from the original one water liquid to give us one water gas which means our delta H for this step reaction is now minus two times the original delta H, 44.0 kilojoules per mole. That's gonna be minus 88.0 kilojoules per mole. And that shouldn't surprise us that it's a negative number. We're essentially condensing. This is a condensation transition. We're going from a gas to a liquid. Those gas molecules are coming together under the attractive intermolecular forces. There's going to be an energy release as everything clumps together and some energy released. In fact, minus 88.0 kilojoules per mole for this balanced equation as written. Well, we're going to do the same thing for the methane and the carbon dioxide because they only showed up in one and only one step reaction as well. For methane, we need one stoichiometric coefficient of the reactant, methane, and the step reaction one we have is for one stoichiometric coefficient of a reactant. We've got the right amount on the right side, which means step reaction one, no change needed. So step reaction one, we could write down again as methane gas plus one oxygen gas gives us CH2O gas plus uh, some water gas. And we've seen the delta H for this reaction is in our data, minus 284 kilojoules per mole. Now, we've taken care of methane completely. We've taken care of the two liquid water completely. The only thing that shows up in one and only one step reaction is that one product, CO2, which shows up in step reaction two as one stoichiometric coefficient of product. We've got the right amount in the right place again. So step reaction two, no change is needed. Uh, and again, let's write down that reaction just so we can. So that's CH2O gas plus O2 gas gives us some carbon dioxide gas and water. And again, let's be careful. In the gas phase, one stoichiometric coefficient of each. Well, we've got those three step reactions accounted for. We've done all the changes we can with them. Now you're going to say to me, well, what about that oxygen, the two reactant oxygen that we need to deal with? If we've got the right step reactions and we've done things appropriately, they will come along for the ride because we've already made the adjustments to the two step reactions we needed to, to effectively get things in the right place. So I'm going to rewrite these three step reactions now. Step reaction one, where no change was needed. CH4 
gas plus O2 gas gives me CH2O gas plus water gas. And we saw delta H for this reaction was minus 284 kilojoules per mole, which is now reminding me that I forgot to mention that delta H here did not change. And that is going to be at the minus 518 still for that second step reaction. I'm just going to put a nice dividing line here so we can kind of keep track of what's going on. Our new version of step reaction two, even though there's really nothing new about it because we didn't do anything, is the CH2O gas plus O2 gas gives us CO2 gas plus H2O gas. And our delta H in that case is minus 518 kilojoules per mole. Excellent. It's the third step reaction that we changed. Maybe I'll do it in a different color just to kind of really emphasize that. It was two water gas becoming two liquid water. And we calculated a new enthalpy change for this new reaction, again, because we had to reverse the original one, changing the sign, and we had to double the amount because there's twice as much stuff that we're trying to deal with. We saw that was minus 88. Whoops. Rainbow pen is probably not the best choice for this. If we've done everything right, this should all add up. We've now figured out the steps and how they actually make the staircase to get us from the same bottom to the same top or the same top to the same bottom. It doesn't matter. In this case, where we're releasing energy, we probably started at the top of some stairs and went down. We're trying to figure out the steps. If that's the case, the steps have to give us the overall balanced equation. We can add these reactions together and they will have to give us the overall balanced equation. If they don't, we've made a mistake. That's like saying, I want to go from here to the movie theater and then I take the path that takes me to uh, the bakery instead. The steps didn't add up to where I wanted to go, so the energy that it took just doesn't make sense. Now, when it comes to adding reactions together, it's pretty simple. Clump together things all on the reactant side of the arrow and cancel out things that show up on the product side. There are several ways to do this. To really emphasize that, I'm just going to take all of my reactants from the three-step reactions and write them down. So we start with methane from step reaction one, plus O2 gas from step reaction one, plus the CH2O from step reaction two, plus the O2 from step reaction two, plus the two water from step reaction three. Those are all of our reactants from the three new step reactions given in a list. We'll do the same thing for the products and put an arrow here. We've got CH2O gas. From the first one, we've got some H2O gas from the first one. We've got some CO2 gas from the first one, uh, from the second one, sorry. Some H2O gas from the second one. And the two liquid water from the new third step reaction. Well, a few things we can note. Here we've got oxygens. So we could get rid of one of those and put a two in front of it. I'm not going to do that. I just want to point it out that you could. And the same thing could be done with uh, these two uh, gaseous waters on the product side. Again, I could cross one of those out and put a two here. Uh, I'm not going to do that, try and keep things there. But again, you have to find what works for you. But what I should know is that if I see some chemicals on both sides of the arrow that are the same, I can cancel those out. And most specifically, it's these two water gas can take these two water gases. And since they show up on opposite sides of this arrow here, those can cancel out. 
That's like saying they were there at the top of the steps and they're there still at the bottom of the steps, so we don't really have to worry about them in this particular case. We can also do the same thing with this reactant CH2O gas and this product CH2O gas and cancel those two things out. Now I might want to say to myself, okay, these two things I can collect together to give a overall situation. So now that I've canceled out everything that I can, what I've been left with is CH4 gas plus 2O2 gas on the reactant side give me CO2 gas plus 2H2O liquid on the product side. Well, wait a second. All the way back here. CH4 plus 2O2 gives us CO2 and two liquid water. That is the overall reaction that we're interested in. We have figured out how to move our steps around and multiply and reverse signs however we need to get an overall reaction that is described in the three step reactions. And we had to make some changes to one of the step reactions to make that work. So what that means is delta H for this reaction is going to be the delta H for reaction one plus the delta H for reaction two, which we didn't change, plus, and again, let's do it in a different color, delta H for reaction three, that's been modified right here. That's gonna be the minus 284 kilojoules per mole, plus minus 518, kilojoules per mole plus another minus 88.0 kilojoules per mole. And what we're going to get from this is the delta H for the reaction that we're interested in minus 890 kilojoules per mole. Combustion reaction. Expecting a negative number in the hundreds of two thousands of kilojoules per mole range. Since it's the combustion of methane, a relatively small molecule, 890 is actually kind of our benchmark in a lot of ways for combustion reactions. When I talk hundreds of kilojoules per mole for a combustion reaction, chances are pretty good that we're still talking about high hundreds, six, seven, eight, nine hundred kilojoules per mole before we get into the um, thousands. But the only combustion reaction where you might see a much smaller uh, negative number is the combustion of hydrogen to form water. In that particular case, we're breaking uh, less bonds, and so that combustion reaction might have a bit less. But this is the power of Hess's law. You can take something that you don't know the energy change for. In this case, it's an enthalpy change, but if you have known steps which you can manipulate to get you from the same beginning to the same end, you will be able to calculate the energy for those unknown reactions. So of the billions and billions of reactions that are possible in the universe, we don't need to actually do the experiments for most of them. And we're gonna find out there are even better ways of applying Hess's law to get enthalpies for reactions.